All right. So let's talk about burns right quick. It's not, not a big thing. Uh, burns are extremely painful. Uh, you know, most people like me have only uh, burnt my fingers on the grill or something, you know, and I whine and cry about that uh, nonstop. And then you have these burns that we're going to look like that are significant burns, okay? So in review, make sure that you you know the different layers of the uh, of the skin and and uh, you know it is the largest organ in the body so make sure that you're, you're aware of that in review to go over that uh, make sure you're aware of the functions of the skin it, it, you know it protects us and provides insulation controls body heat uh, protects us from all those microorganisms as well all right the uh, the biggest thing that we one of the biggest things that we look at when we look at the air a burn is the airway involved in it because what happens is the airway will shut down completely be occluded uh, closed up really quick with superheated air the way most people get it if it's not a toxic gas you know like a, a chlorine or something that a big toxic gas or just superheated air like an apartment fire or a house fire or something they breathe in that superheated air uh, and, it, and it causes angioedema or edema in the throat and the throat will swell very quickly, okay, within just minutes. So those things are really important. Uh, you get any signs of, you know, burns to the airway, your ALS back up. Because right? that person really needs to be intubated sooner than later. So if they see you know, soot around the mouth, they, you open the patient's mouth and you see redness in the back of their throat, hoarseness, like strider and everything. They, that patient really needs to be intubated sooner than later. We don't want their airway closed. Then that full paramedic has to do that frightening procedure of doing a surgical airway. And it is, it's, it, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool but it's frightening when you start cutting people's throats. So we don't, we don't want that, right? And uh, definitely don't want that airway to, uh, to close. So maintain their airway, patent airway or open airway. Look for ventilation problems, oxygenation problems, okay? They get fluid loss because of the capillaries start to leak, okay? As the skin burns away, you get this increased capillary permeability which decreases the intravascular fluid. So it's going to, those capillaries are going to start leaking. So we get, uh, I think the book called it burn shock. You know, I don't really call that, but it's hypovolemic shock, but it's due to a burn. Then you can get the uh, edema, right? Swelling, which is going to cause tissue, uh, lack of tissue perfusion. That's why you remove these rings on the hands and stuff. You remove these constricting objects as soon as possible. Uh, rings, uh, not this little thin wedding ring, but like a, a class ring or something, it's extremely hard to cut off. Uh, uh, we tried to cut this guy's ring off, and we just couldn't get it cut. We had a, a ring cutter as well, and we couldn't get it cut. The ring just wouldn't cut. Of course, it was associated with a fracture, but uh, it will. These, the rings will cause uh, like a tourniquet, okay? Then, the, like we talked about, that fluid shift due to these leaking capillaries, and so you get hypovolemic with, with that. Respiratory, we just talked about, that superheated air causes obstruction in the airway. The smoke will do the same thing. It will cause those laryngeal spasms, and for that throat to close up, and, and this toxic, these toxic gases as, as well. Cyanide, uh, hopefully you never hear, hear uh, smell that because you wouldn't live too long afterwards. Uh, that's why your safety is paramount if there's a gas involved in it, right? You want to make sure that you uh, seem safe, right? That your safety is paramount. And it's not like TV. They don't run into a burning building without like an SCBA on. They, they just wouldn't do it. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, they're protected as well, that they were in the proper uh, protection. But these toxic gases here, 
sulfur dioxide you would you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to breathe with that smell like rotten eggs uh, your battery blowing up you, uh, your car battery if you ever smell rotten eggs if you drive along you smell rotten eggs y'all you know what rotten eggs smell like mm -hmm. stop pull off to the side stop very quickly and get out of your car or your battery's probably about to explode so you you want to really avoid that uh, battery can explode and get up into the driver's compartment uh, perhaps but that's just one of those smells you, you just can't uh, you can't breathe in it okay it also uh, affects the kidneys it starts to increase the amount of uh, waste products as the skin burns away as the tissue burns away the cell destruction uh, starts to produce a lot of waste product and your kidneys go into failure they can't handle all that okay so it with the hypovolemia it decreases blood flow uh, to the kidneys which is going to decrease urine output so the burns just doesn't affect the just the skin where it's burned right a, a significant burn a large surface area burn uh, affects quite a bit more as we look at it. nerve endings can be destroyed like in third degree burns you remember you know we burn down to the epidermis the dermis right the subcutaneous tissue then we get down into the nerves and when the nerves are burnt you, the patient actually doesn't feel the burn in that area because the nerves are burnt off right it's like a bad tooth when the nerves are not intact you, the tooth doesn't hurt anymore because you can't feel it Does that mean y'all have ever had a bad tooth like that okay and then of course extremities you lose loss of function the burns you get burns in the joints and everything you, you lose loss of function to it so again several different things that could take place with it within there uh, due to the hypovolemia and uh, what's that auto regulation you know the, the body's moving blood flow around to more vital organs uh, and away from the gut you get the nausea and which nausea leads to vomiting sometimes okay so the way that we classify these burns is a superficial first degree second degree third degree and then this fourth degree burn is a little different I've only seen one uh, and it, this guy would it looked like fried chicken he was burnt so bad so a first degree a superficial burn almost everybody has had a first degree burn that would equal up to a sunburn where the skin's reddened right it, it turns red a, a sunburn a good good sunburn superficial burn is the is a first degree burn you've seen these guys that you know they're laying out and they hit the flip they fall asleep they don't quit they have that nice red appearance on their back and they're all white in front uh, that's a first degree burn um, it could be significant enough depends on the body surface area right it would require treatment most of them don't require any treatment it's a, it's essentially a sunburn okay cool that burn off it, has, it hasn't really burned through the you know it's just really burned the epidermis and into the dermis perhaps so it's not really that thick of a burn okay uh, Remember, whatever you put on a burn, the burn center has to take off, okay? So our, our treatment is essentially uh, dry sterile dressing or moist dressing depending on the size of the burn. A small burn, less than 10%, uh, you, can, you can put a moist dressing on it to sort of cool it off, okay? A large significant burn, they're going to need narcotics. Uh, so if you have a patient with a large burn, you need ALS back up because that patient's going to need narcotics uh, to control the pain. Uh, uh, way back in the day, these superficial burns, we used to carry shaving cream on the ambulance. It's the best thing for a sunburn, by the way, uh, because the fact that it's sterile in the can until you push the button, okay? So it's sterile, so it's really clean. So let's say you have a big, huge sunburn on the back. You're just not like the menthol, like regular foaming. 
Right? No menthol? I know what menthol shaving cream is. It, like, it's heated, it burns. You wouldn't want to put menthol on it. Oh, never mind. I uh, have to explain it too much. But the uh, regular foamy shaving cream all over the back. Let it sort of sit there to it dries and it starts pooling. Then hop in the shower and rinse it off. It's easily rinsed off, okay? Never any type of petroleum product. You know, like probably by now your great grandmother wants to put butter or something on it. Uh, or the Cajuns, especially. They're put the butter on it, you know? But uh, it's a petroleum product. So what will happen is that petroleum product will retain the heat, it won't release the heat, right? And so it's, it's still not really stopping the burning process. It's going to retain the heat underneath the, the butter or whatever. Butter used to be one of the big things. Everybody put butter on it. Why, why butter? Why did people put butter on it? I have no clue. Like what? Like it's like it's for it to like cool down the butter? What do you say? Well, yeah. It's cold. It's cold. It's cold and it's cool and it temporarily it's going to cool the burn but long term and not long term it's in long term but uh, eventually it's going to retain that heat and it's, it's still going to burn if you don't feel the heat okay so superficial burn not a big thing I think we have some pictures coming up a partial thickness or a second degree burn is sort of it it's uh, it's classified by the blisters so when you start blistering or the patient starts blistering from the burn, uh, that's a, that would be a second degree burn. We want to make sure that we keep those burns intact or the blisters intact. Right? We don't want to pop the blisters uh, if all possible, because that's sort of the last line of defense for the uh, for the skin, that little blister. Uh, one of the major problems with burns is, in, you know, they get to the hospital and then they have infection. Okay, so we want to we want to avoid that. Dry sterile dressing. Try to keep the blisters intact. You can have a second degree sunburn, right? Has anybody had one of those? We form blisters up. So the uh, and then the third degree burn is a full thickness burn. It's burned down to the muscle. So it's burned down through the through the nerve endings into the muscle. It's a third degree burn or full thickness. Partial thickness is not burned down into the muscle. A fourth degree burn is burnt, a burn to the bone. So uh, this one that I saw, this guy, he, I don't know, he was working obviously, but he poured hot molten steel in his boot. Yeah, and it, it burned him. His legs looked like chicken, like on a grill. I mean, it was burned straight to the bone. Uh, we gave him so many drugs it should have stopped his breathing. But uh, he was all happy when we got the park line. Because he was so high. But you know, besides that, I mean when he woke up and when he woke up from that, they were probably gonna have to amputate the leg. because uh, it was it was burned so bad. So electrical burns can cause that it, you know, like lightning strikes or something because of the of the high voltage, okay? And then, uh, so, boss epidermis, not really superficial, uh, the partial thickness burns, the full thickness. What we look at, when we look at sort of this third degree burn, because this, the second degree burns, it's recognized by blisters, okay? This third degree burn is going to give sort of a leathery type appearance to the skin. They're going to look uh, like that old cowboy that spent 50 years out in the sun. I mean, they're really just going to be sort of leathery type appearance, okay? On electrical burns, we want to look for an entrance and an exit wound. Huh? So lightning strike will enter one and go through the body and exit somewhere as well. And we want to make sure that we are... We are uh, protecting the spine because the muscles can contract, break bones uh, as it contracts and it, it can run across the heart and cause an override in the heart's natural electrical pattern, right? So it can put the patient in V-fib. 
So here's just some pictures. No, I mean, this, uh, I think I have better pictures, but epidermis, the partial thickness, the epidermis and the dermis, and then the full thickness all the way down to the muscle, just like we talked about. You know the characteristics of the bleeding, I mean the blisters, okay? So there's a picture, superficial, uh, looks like a really bad sunburn, right? So that's sort of spotchy. And then a partial thickness burn, note the blisters, keep the, those blisters intact if all possible. Huh? Most of the time, the, uh, what happens with a lot of these burns, the patient will start trying to rinse it with water, like a water hose or something. And that's the last thing that you want on a burn is tap water. There's so many microbes in the tap water, you don't want that. When, if we rinse this, it would be with sterile solution, sterile saline, okay? We wouldn't put any kind of tap water. You want to avoid tap water on a, a burn. You know, if these blisters were not intact, you'd really want to avoid tap water. Uh, you probably wouldn't drink it if you looked at it close enough under a microscope. But that's okay. The little crawly things in it, they're, they're harmless, probably. Uh, most things they give us, like, a little diarrhea or something. But look, look at some water under a microscope. You see all your little friends waving to you. You look underneath them and go, I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> But, and that's clean water. That's acceptable clean water. Okay. Uh, go go somewhere else that has dirty water, and and look at the difference. They could could kill you. And then the here's another partial thickness burn to the face. This guy here, if you were to do the size up on him, you 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 look at them. You came up and had this facial burn like this. You would like, we need ALS. Okay? I would come up on that guy and I would intubate him. He, he needs to be intubated with all that facial burns just to, pr to protect his airway. One of the first things on my mind would be to tube him and probably to control pain. All right? So the, uh, and then a full thickness burn, sort of burn down through the dermis. See how leathery that sort of looks in there it's just like it's just all charred up and it is the skin's just all burned up it's sort of charred and hard okay so uh third degree burns a lot of people with third degree burns especially full thickness burns with a lot of what's called bsa body substance not body substance body surface area okay if they have a large body sub surface area burn they're, they're fatal, okay? Uh, you hear these guys that burn, you know, 80, 90% of their body. Mm -hmm. So most of those guys die from that. You know, they, they have a lot of a lot of problems. Uh, I had a friend die from that, uh, crashed in a helicopter, and 90% of his body was third degree burns. So the, uh, he lived a couple of days, three or four days maybe, I think, but people, and as far as getting uh, infection, that's that's a huge thing in, in fighting off uh, the shock as, as well. And then here's sort of one to the legs. Here, does that, I need to show you my burn one because it looks like chicken on the grill. No, not so much there, but sort of a, a burn to the legs. Uh, and a full thickness burn. It's very significant burns. All these are, are except that first one, that partial, uh, I mean that uh, superficial burn, not so significant, but all these are significant burns. You can take these to the uh, burn center. So when we, when we look at them, we look at the depth of the burn, where it is, the location, anything in the face, the hands, the feet, the genitalia, a circling top burn that circles the body is all considered critical burns. Uh, uh, had this guy one time, his hands, uh, 
and he was cooking and uh, frying up something. Anyway, the handle over the thing, he hit the handle and the grease fell on the ground and he slipped on the grease. And what do you do when you slip and fall? What goes out first? Your hands. And he slipped and fell and he stuck his hands in that hot grease. I, I told my partner, I said, I can hear him screaming as we pulled up over the siren. <laughs> Almost. I, I thought I heard him scream. But we, we opened the door and all you could hear is him screaming. And he was sitting on the front porch with his hands out like this and the skin was just sort of sloughing off of his hands. And he was just screaming, like, you know. And uh, surface area, not much, like 2%, right? Maybe 3% burn, but a very critical burn. We put him on a helicopter and flew him to, to uh, Dallas, but couldn't give the guy enough narcotics. He was, he was just in pain the whole time we had him. And we gave him some powerful stuff, but he was just, we wrapped him, dry, still dressing over his hands, starting out to be even more adult, but still in a lot of pain. So, uh, so those, those things as well as location, big thing, patient's age, a young patient, they have more body surface area considering their height, right? And uh, so there's, these are the things we look at, mainly depth and location uh, and body surface area. We, we have this thing called the rule of nines that we go down through. You will have to memorize the rule of nines. Okay, just put it in your head now. You have to memorize the rule of nines for adult and pediatrics, because if you get a burn question, it will be the rule of it. You figuring out body surface area on the rule of nines. Every question I've ever seen, uh, National Registry, any test, all the burn questions are figuring out body surface area, the rule of nines. Okay, and we'll go through that in a minute. Okay, so. We, we talked about that, face, inhalation problems, loss of function, circumferential burns that encircles the body, those are bad, especially in the chest wall. You have a circumferential burn in the chest wall, what don't you get? Or big burns, anterior burns to the chest, what, what won't you get? Why? Very good, you can't expand the chest wall. So you're not going to get hardly any tidal volume. So that's a problem. These patients will probably need to have positive pressure ventilation, okay? They don't tolerate uh, under two. They, they get a greater fluid loss. Over 50, they get this greater fluid loss and heat loss in, in children, okay? The heat, fluid and heat loss are greater in infants and children. Right? They all need to go, any really, any pediatric burn, straight to the burn center. Like just any pediatric trauma, you would go straight to the, straight to a trauma center with it, okay? And then here's a little, this is in your book, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you need to make sure that you are very familiar with this in the, in the sense that because critical burns is a different treatment. Like a critical third degree burn is a dry still dressing. A non-critical burn up to about 10%, you can put a moist sterile dressing on it. So the treatment's going to be same, a little different, okay? And, uh, and on your answer choices on the test, you'll have both. Dry sterile dressing, moist sterile dressing. You have to decide which one that you're going to put on there, okay? And then this chart sort of tells you these dry... Dry, uh, critical burns, a dry sterile dressing. If if you covered that with, this, let's say this guy laying here, this big burn here on the side of this guy's uh, thorax, if you put more sterile dressings all over that, what would you create? What would what would be one of the things that you you would create? What does skin do? Absorbs. Regulates the what? Body temperature. Right. What don't? Doesn't he have? Skin. skin. 
Now you cover him with fluid. So it would decrease his body temperature? Right. Get the hypothermic. You can cause hypothermia. So that's why you want to do a dry sterile dressing. When in doubt, it's really a dry sterile dressing. This foot here, it's probably about 2% at best. He had big feet. Okay, it's still a critical burn because it's on the foot, but that's not going to cause hypothermia. So you could put a more sterile dressing over that to help cool the burn off. All right, uh, more st sterile means like sterile water or saline out of an IV bag or something or container. Okay, no tap water, and then you get into these different. Uh, here, this chart. By no means would you want to memorize this, but uh, just sort of be familiar with it. Okay, sort of like the Glasgow Coma Scale. You don't really need to memorize it that much, but you need to be really familiar with it, uh, so you can you can see those questions. And this one I talked about soot around this guy. This guy was in a, you know, led to believe he was in a fire because he has soot all around his mouth, right? So he was in some sort of trapped environment where he was breathing in superheated air or at least smoke. So that's one of the injuries that you know. None, this is not necessarily a burn. It's just probably soot. It might be a little minor burn, but it's mainly just soot. And that's just one of the signs. It's like, hey, you know, he's been trapped in a house fire or something, and he could have airway compromise. So the rule of nines... Uh, do you have a chart in your book on it? Yeah. This chart on 881 and 880, okay, for the kiddo, the little infant, you need to, you, you need to memorize that. What the rule of nine does is it, it uh, determines body surface area. I'm going to have to cheat. So, uh, the anterior trunk for an adult is 18%. So, if the, the whole interior trunk and abdomen is burned, that's 18%. Like the arm is, uh, the upper extremity is 9%, right? So, if the burn is just below... You know, and this is where the directional terms are going to come in. So they're going to say the medial aspect of this or the lateral aspect. So they're saying here, hey, uh, this forearm. So this forearm would be four and a half percent, right? So you have to take the percentage based on what the scenario is telling you. And you're, you're going to have to read it really slow and, and think about, okay, this is that. This is four and a half. This is... You know, this is this percentage, right? And then to uh, to come up with the with the body surface area. So a bust. If you want to get those burn questions, you have to memorize the rule of nines. It either be a rule of nines or is it dry sterile dressing or a more sterile dressing, right? Uh, for a quick reference, and you would want this. Let's say that you know you're you're calling in ALS and you're giving them a report, they will want to know what percent, what's the body surface area. Give me a, give me a BSA. And they're going to want to know that, right? So you give them, and it's broken down into, you know, like 4% first degree, 8% second degree, 10% third degree or whatever. So it's broken down into different classes, right? So you want to know how many... Uh, percent on first degree, second degree, and third degree. If you're just out for a very quick uh, estimate, take the patient's palm. No, not like literally, but the palm size is one percent. So unless it's just this really big person with huge hands, then uh, you know you could take okay, their hands about the same as mine. You just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So the palm equals one percent. So you can sort of do a quick estimate there. Once you get the patient stabilized, then you'd want to figure out using the rule of nines, okay?
That's very important. So there's a list. You know, uh, thermal, that's like the heat is a thermal burn, right? Fire, heat, sun, ther thermal, or radiation. Which one? Thermal, right? If it was a radiation burn, you'd be dead. You'd die from a sunburn. Inhalation burns, very serious. Chemical burns, you need to know what the chemical is. It's very important to understand what the chemical is and how to uh, neutralize the chemical. Like we, I think we talked about that dry powder, right? Get dry powder on them. Make sure you figure out what that dry powder is. You just keep start pouring water on the dry powder. You don't know what it is. It, it can activate the powder and start really burning the patient then. Electrical burns always look for an entrance wound, exit wound, spinal immobilization, right? Look out for cardiac events along with it. Hopefully you never see radiation burns. Uh, but all these all these burns, these different types, you you will want to uh, make sure that you're protected, right? You don't go into the source and risk injury. What would be a contact burn? Like you put your hand in a like accidentally put your hand in like some hot grease. Yeah. Or stove, touch the stove. Yeah. Touch the fire, right? Scalding burns. This is why you turn the handle away from the stove. Little kids, right? <clears throat> you, you you're cooking that ramen noodle because you're a poor college student and you have some little kids running around and you have the handle over the over the stove outward. Huh? Kids are curious animals so they reach up and they grab the handle and they pull the scal scalding hot water on, on top of them. That's like child care 101 to make sure all the handles are turned to the inside so little kids can't reach up and get them. Okay. Uh, electrical burns, like I said, uh, Someone that gets struck by uh, electricity, they didn't take that warning when the horns went off on the golf course and there's lightning everywhere and they get struck by lightning. It's going to travel to ground. Electricity will always travel to ground. So it's going to have an entrance point and an exit point. And the exit point can be explosive, so you have to sort of be aware and protect the, the spine because of the contractions, just like we talked about. Flash burns are very common in grills. Uh, I've been on a few of these. You know, little Johnny's with Big Johnny. Dad's grilling. The boy wants to be right there with them, right? Uh, they light the grill, let it heat up, shut the grill door so it will uh, get hot in there. But what happens is that, and they have this on the news almost every year, to keep little kids away from the grill like this, the flame will go out, like in a gas grill, the flame will go out, and then once you open the gas grill again, once you open the lid, what do you provide? Oxygen. 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 You, ha you have to have three things for fire. Oxygen, fuel, fuel and heat. heat. Okay? So, they open the gas grill, it provides a lot of oxygen to it and it flashes out, okay? Dad's going, whoa, <laughs> right? Little Johnny's face is about the same place as the grill. So they get flash burned on their face. So you have to make sure that back up from the grill. Uh, everybody just teaches them, oh, don't touch the grill, it's hot, but don't, don't have them around when you op open the lid either. Be cautious of that. Okay. So the assessment is pretty much the same, okay? We still want uh, 10 minutes with this trauma, any trauma. We do our same size up. Uh, primary assessment's the same, except we want to really focus on the airway if, it's, uh, if we suspect burns to the face. You can cool the burns with, with saline you should put sterile water here or saline. Like we said, remove the rings and everything. If the clothes are still on fire, <laughs> move the clothes. You know, cut the smoldering clothes off of them. Just don't let them sit there and burn, okay? 
put them out. They're like for you. They're, they're, they're like you forever if you put them out. Indication of airway burns, we already talked about. Uh, keep a close eye on this because it can, it's a developing factor that develops quickly. All right? And then you just go down your, uh, your trauma assessment for your secondary, okay? Remove the clothing. Get a good BSA body set, uh, surface area with using the rule of nines. Right? Vital signs, good history, depth, location, right? Look for signs of that inhalation burn. It keeps repeating that because it's so important, okay? Not to forget that. Uh, I made the mistake once of not tubing this guy and, you know, bad, very bad. <laughs> he set his place of business on fire. He tried to commit suicide. Anyway, I just transported him. And uh, about five minutes into the transport, he needed to be tubed. And so the, uh, I should have tubed him then because he had all the, all the indications. I guess it's good that I didn't do him because he confessed to the crime. His sister came in and he ended up actually confessing to the crime that he set the fire. And I guess he thought he was going to die or something, so he wanted to get that off his chest. You know, he confessed to setting the fire and uh, the police were in the room. <laughs> so, when he did it. All right. Uh, just like we just said, make sure it's safe, but brush away these dry dry powders after you find out what's wrong with them, remove the, the clothes. Here, see he has the, the bag of saline. You, you would cut that clothing away, that clothing's sort of nasty, get it away first, okay? But uh, then you can dump some, some sterile water, some uh, sterile saline over that, a small burn to, to help cool it off. I uh, almost had to fight this guy one time because he wouldn't he wouldn't stop with the water hose. I mean we couldn't even treat him because he just wouldn't stop wetting himself down with the water hose. And uh, it, it took a while to convince him to, to stop. We'll give you some drugs. Just You just have to stop, okay? Uh, cut the clothes away and then uh, continue with your reassessment. Make sure, you know, you evaluate the need for oxygen, evaluate the need, they need a non-rebreather, they need, do they need to go ahead and be bagged, they need uh, positive pressure ventilation, all right, and then uh, transport, rapid transport, and then also just, you know, like I said, keep in mind ALS, right, all, all the time. Talk about that leads to hypothermia. More still dressing, like I said, less than 10%. That's that's usually it's a standing factor, 10%. What do you do if you if you have a burn at 10%? How are you gonna recognize the patient's getting cold? Sure. Yeah, they're gonna start shivering a little bit. So you uh, you make sure that wasn't stick. You make sure that, that wasn't stuck to the patient, but. Uh, you take those more sterile dressings off and change them for a dry sterile dressing. When in doubt, it's dry sterile. Uh, even if it sticks to the burn, when they get to the burn center, they can uh, moisten that up before they, before they peel it off. Uh, and treat for shock, transport. And then just rapid transport. This just goes through a, a list of what you would take to a burn center Okay, and you can read over that, uh, you know, like when you read the chapter, read, read through that, uh, nothing, nothing to memorize, because really anything, any significant burn, I would take to a burn center. Uh, Hands, feet, toes. Okay, this is important here. Uh, you got that burn to the hand, and you wrap it tight like this, and the burning process is still 
taking place. They get to the hospital. We think one procedure they're going to have to do. If you know you wrap that hand up, the burning process is still taking place. What do you think? You think their fingers are going to melt together? Oh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So they're going to have to take and do a surgical surgical procedure where they uh, take the fingers out. Just take those four by think there's pictures. Yeah. Take those to the fingers and toes. Just take some four by fours and keep the fingers and toes separated so they don't melt together like that. Otherwise, you create a duck thing, right? Burns to the eyes. Uh, the rule for eyes, and we'll go through facial injuries at a later day. But if you cover one eye, cover both eyes, and remember that your patient now is blind. Okay. So when you move them, don't you, you have to tell them everything. Hey, we're gonna move you over. Hey, this is what we're doing. Because uh, they can't, they can't see you anymore. Uh, we already know this from trauma. Every five minutes, you reassess every five minutes from unstable patients. Every 15 minutes, uh, for stable, continuously evaluate the air. We've already talked about this. Uh, brush them away. If it doesn't react with water, copious means a lot of water. What I normally do is I, I rinse that until we get there. A lot of times, uh, I run out of fluid, I'm rinsing that so much and just open the doors and saline starts just flowing out the back of the animals, right? But especially eyes, burns to the eyes, rinse, rinse that. You get chemical in the eye, rinse it, just keep rinsing it. I rinse it the entire transport a lot of times, just to make sure it's out. Ears, same way, I mean, not don't have to rinse them. But uh, dry still dressing over the ear, very very small burn. So you know if this is the only burn, then you can put a more stressing on that. Uh, so the relief relief some of the the burning. Then small burns to the hand. Now this is to the hand, okay? But is this a critical burn? It falls in that category, right? You know, so you have to evaluate that. This, like these small chemical burns to the hand, if they still, if they have good function of that hand, then that's probably not a critical burn. Uh, it's it's a pretty small burn. Uh, form a little pocket there. That might be a blister. You know, it just might be some shifts and fluid. But it's still important to know that it's to the hand. Okay, most doctors won't even mess with the hands, so that uh, most hands have to go to to a burn center. Because most just regular ER doctors, they don't mess with hands. They don't like to. Uh, we need our hands, right? So they don't like messing with them. They send them to a a, a, a specialist. That and the wrist, they don't like messing with the hands and the wrist. Okay. So the uh, in the discussion, there's some different uh, different types of acids. Different. So let's say that we this acid here is spilt on the patient, and you're going, "What in the world is that? You know, what do we do for that? What what do we do for that burn, right?" That's, that's where you would contact uh, poison control, maybe. You'd look in, you'd have dispatch look this, this up treatment-wise in a, in a, uh, on their computer in dispatch. Uh, if you have Google, just ask Google. What treatment? What, what do we do for the treatment? There's a lot of different uh, chemicals and everything that that's like in, in industrial type places. And they have, it used to be way back in the day, they had material safety data sheets, MSDS sheets, but now all that is on the computer. So while you're doing your treatment, you could say, hey, we have this 
hydrofluoric acid on this patient, we need to know what to do. So they would turn to their MSDS uh, application and dispatch and type it in and give you instructions on what to do. If this happens at an industrial plant, more than likely they already pulled that information for you. So they would come up with it. Here's the MSDS sheet for that, and then you can read it and see what it, see what it does. Like dry lime would say don't don't use water. It, it activates with water, and it really burns after that. So brush brush it off. You know, get as much as off as you can. And, and know what the chemical is. Protect yourself from the chemical. So if this is burning this person, probably what, now she has her gloves on, but should she have on anything else, you think? What would you put on besides gloves? Probably a mask so I won't. Huh? Probably a mask so that I don't breathe in the whatever that is, the powder. Yeah, I would put on a mask. Just as I'm brushing it off, I don't go, oh, that burns, you know? Yeah. So that, uh, good. So, be, and be, ca be cautious with the powder. It, it goes everywhere, right? It's like, you know, like body powder. You put body powder on, it's all over the place. So you don't want to breathe that stuff in. And I wouldn't even brush it off until I figured out what it was. If it's something really bad, then maybe I need a hazmat team out there to clean this person, decontaminate this person, right? I, I, I could start brushing that off and all of a sudden we find out what it is and it's this big bag chemical X and now I'm contaminated with it. So sometimes it's, it requires a hazmat team. That's for another day, but uh, be very careful with powders and stuff in, in industrial sites. Like I said before, flush the eye continuously. That's that's what I always try to do. One thing about this that just cracks me up on this flushing the eye, if that patient doesn't want you to flush their eye, because this is painful, flushing out somebody's eyes, it's, it's painful for the patient, uh, They're not. you're not going to do it. If that patient goes here and, and they won't open their eye, you can't open that eye with the jaws of life. Uh, I've tried it on little kids before. Say, open your eye. And they go, no, it hurts. It hurts. I don't want to open. And you can't force that eye on there. Those little muscles around the eye, they're short and thick. And when it clamps down, they won't open it. So if you try to flush it, you're just washing their eyelashes off. Okay? Fortunately, ALS wise, most people carry this drug called tetracaine. You get them open, you drop it in there, it numbs the eye. You can flush it all day because it doesn't hurt anymore. I can't feel it. It's it's a lidocaine product, so it numbs it up. But be aware of that. That's one of the pitfalls of flushing an eye. If the patient doesn't want their eye flushed and they shut it, they won't open it. You won't you won't open it by force. That's for sure. Talked about this entrance wound, exit wounds disrupt the electrical system of the heart. Here, the patient's laying on the electrical source. They're being electrocuted right in front of you. All right. If you're not trained to remove them from that, don't move them, okay? Because we're good conductors of electricity, right? Definitely, if you come in contact with the pa that patient, that person, you're going now. You're you're being electrocuted. I've seen. Or, you know, on TV, you hear these crazy things. Someone throwing a belt over there and trying to loop them and, and pull them off the source, right? Uh, it's a hard one, but that seems not safe with that electrical source out there. You have to have someone that controls the electricity. So go shut the electricity off if possible, okay? Especially in a car wreck, too. You have electric power lines down. Ooh. You know, you have to be really careful with those. Anyway, a good little picture showing in in through here, out through the ground, just as we talked about. It's going across the heart. It's going to affect the electrical activity of the heart. Entrance wound, exit wound, and then to come out the ground, so to come out anything. These electrical burns, especially like a lot of electricity,
causes all the muscles to contract. So you you have to suspect spinal cord injury because of all the contraction, broken fractures, all right? So full immobilization as well. Ow. A small burn, right? Not too bad. Electricity can can really really burn. High high voltage. High voltage, low amperage, okay? Is may not kill the patient. High voltage moderate to high amperage is gonna kill the patient. Am the amperage is what kills the patient. Amperage is the force. So you can be struck by thirty thousand volts in in lift there, right? Is that true? You think that's true? Well, I mean, 20, 30,000 volts. I think that's true. Uh, the word measure volts or force. Yeah, let's go. With, yeah, because I've been hit by 20,000 volts before. But way back in the day, repairing teeth, I used to repair electronic equipment when they had actual picture tubes in them. The back part of that picture tube was about 20,000 volts. You never stuck your left hand. In there, you always work with your right hand, right? Because you don't want the electricity to go across your heart. So you, you, you're working with your right man. You bump that picture tube, and it has a charge in it. Even if the TV's off, there's still a charge in that picture tube, and it is zap you. I hurt for days, but it was very, very low amperage. It wasn't hurting any amperage, but it was a lot of voltage. Right? So I've been shocked like a lot. But because I used to repair this uh, electronic equipment. Now everything, you just throw it away. They don't repair anything. But, uh, you see. Huh? So good size up, seen safe. Just, you know, uh, look at the, where they are. Are they, were they in a confined space? Are they still, are they still burning? Was an explosion? You know, blunt force trauma, do you have multiple system trauma, right, that you have to look out for? Uh, and just go through your, your assessment, do your general impression here. Look at the patient, you know, what, what do they appear like? What's your impression? Alter, you know, mental status, airway, strider, their tongue swollen, is their throat swollen up, you know? You can see that right away. Evaluate their breathing circulation and just keep going down uh, systematically. Okay. Same way, physical exam, singed hair, and, you know, do they not have eyebrows anymore? They don't have eyebrows anymore, right? Then they got all that's burned away. It's freaky looking, but. <laughs> You know, uh, hoarseness, that's a big thing. That's That hoarseness is a sign of airway obstruction. So they hacking up this black stuff, the sputum, they coughing up, you know, the carbon p particles they just sucked in their throat. Circumferential burns, big thing, right? Same way with the abdominal burns, extremities. Uh, just your head to toe vital signs. Good set of vital signs. Get a good set of baseline vital signs. Reevaluate those. The airway is probably the biggest. Airway and shock is, is probably the biggest thing that you would you would evaluate. Get as much history as always as you can. Right? And then evaluate the burn. First degree, second degree, third degree body surface area. Right. This is pretty interesting here that no pain in the burned area on a third degree burn because all the nerves are burned away, right? So you don't you don't get a lot of pain there. You get the pain from the associated second degree and first degree burns around it. Dry chemical you know Dry chemical with brush, liquid chemical would get, you, you have to irrigate it, get it off, 
make sure it doesn't react to water to see what it is take the clothes off don't leave part of the liquid don't leave their clothes on with part of the chemical in their clothes right it's still going to uh, continue to burn or talk about the range and everything make sure you get it off dress between the, the digit, digit so you don't create a duck rinse the eyes out right. Yeah, if you, if you have this big thermal burn to the eyes, don't try to open the eyes. I mean, if they're if they're burned burn shut, just leave them, leave them shut. Someone open them up. It's a scalpel. All right. So burns are pretty easy, right? Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing, really, the, is just to. So this is first degree, second degree, third degree, know the characteristics, right? And then the BSA, the rule of nines, and then dry sterile or more sterile, okay? Good for shock, always rapid transport, ALS. Okay, so not, not a big thing. Hard to, hard to work with from the patients. You, you have someone that's on fire. I mean, you, they're not physically like flaming, you know, but they're, they're they're, they're hot, their, their hands are still burning, they still have that burning sensation or their arms or something, if it's a large surface, they're going to be very hard to work with because of the amount of pain that they're in. So, so that's another thing to sort of keep in mind, that this is going to be a, a, a difficult patient based on the amount of pain. All right.